this conference, I think, is groundbreaking in Jamaica and marks um, a significant step. Uh, in fact, it's, well, it's called the first steps uh, in our move towards building a cannabis industry in Jamaica. It's certainly something that the government of Jamaica is interested in achieving. You know, we, it, you know, cannabis or ganja has been a part of our lives. Uh, it may, may have been illegal, but, um, you know, I don't think any Jamaican has not been close to, you know, ganja at some point in time. Um, and I think, you know, the moves to make it, de first decriminalize it and then to actually build an industry around it is, you know, of, of vast importance. We are looking at how we will regulate this industry. You know, work has been progressing, and I think some of that will come to the fore during the two days that we have this conference. So I just want to welcome everyone here. I'm actually going to hand over to our Minister of uh, Tourism and Entertainment, uh, Minister Wickham McNeil, who will do the formal introductions and of those at the head table and set, set the ball rolling. <laughs> Um, I want to just start by making mention of, of some of the persons um, present. Um, first, I'd like to, to mention uh, my colleague Minister, um, uh, Minister Mark Golden, who is here with us, uh, Countess Amanda Felding, um, who is the, the founder of the Beckley Foundation, and her husband, Jamie, who is here as well. Um, Dr. Kathy Ann Brown, the Deputy Solicitor General, Professor Wayne um, McCloggin from the University of the West Indies. I, I think it may be good if, as I mentioned the names, you could at least hold up hands or indicate who you are so that everyone knows who they're talking about. Um, I saw Dr. Winston Delahaye from the National Council on Drug Abuse and Mr. Michael Tucker as well. Uh, from JAMPRO, we have Ms. Dan Edwards, the, the head of JAMPRO. Um, and JTB has a, a family here. Um, I see Jason Hall and, and Janice Allen. And Mary Helen Reese is here as well. And of course, you all know um, Eleanor Hussey, who has done tremendous work in pulling this all, all together. <laughs> I also want to mention the members of the media who have also turned out in full force. Um, not unusual for them to be in the grill, but welcome all. And, and welcome to you all who have taken the time to come here today. So welcome all of you to the grill. Um, we're here to um, have a discussion. Um, Beckley Foundation has has put together this event to have a discussion because of some of the events that have taken place recently. Jamaica has taken a historic move, a truly historic move, and I, I think that um, it, it, in, in, in years to come we will look back at what has happened here in Jamaica and the changes that have taken on in how we treat cannabis and what we're doing with cannabis. And we will look back at these days because we are at the, the head of the curve. It has been revolutionary. Um, we are among few countries in the world who have made these moves. Um, we always talk about states in the United States that have done so, but the actual government has not. And there are some other countries that have. And I, I just want to say that it has been a move that has over the last two years taken place. And I just want to place on record, um, you know, when we sit in cabinet, um, there's a gentleman who sits immediately to my left. And when the decision was taken to um, change the laws as a, the, the Dangerous Drugs Act, he took it in hand and looked at it. And I think the, the methodology that he has used is one that will be used by many other countries when they want to treat this very same thing. And I just want to 
place on record my commendations to my colleague, Minister Mark Gordon, for the tremendous work that he has done. The, in doing what we're doing, we want to ensure certain things. We want to ensure that when, when we were looking at the changes to the Dangerous Drugs Act, we thought, and certainly I endorsed it totally. And, and for two important, I mean, there are many reasons, but for two specific reasons. The first is the, the number of young Jamaicans, and as they got older, who at some point in time may have been caught with a, a little spliff or something and got it on their record, and it has hampered their personal development through the, their lives. And I think that this really was unjust and wrong. And the changes that we have made have, have made tremendous changes to that. And, and that, to me, is one of the most important things that has happened with the changes in the legislation. The second thing, of course, is the, the, the sacramental. For, it, under my ministry, we deal with entertainment. And you know um, the, the input of the Rastafarian community, and this is one of their sacraments, for us to have made it legal within the sacraments was important to me also. But thirdly, and I think more importantly, and, and what we are looking at today is the fact that there are tremendous economic benefits. And as we move along, these benefits will, will, will come to pass. So the fact of the matter is that we, we want to ensure that these benefits accrue to the wide cross-section of Jamaicans rich or poor, but across the cross-section, and those who for years have been involved in one way, shape, or form, we want to ensure that these economic benefits accrue to them. And so the work that will be done by the foundation, the discussions that I had here today are going to be part of that whole policy formulation that the Minister of Justice and the Minister are undertaking. And I think it is, is very important to us we have already started the process. Um, I was very honored, and I think my constituents, and I, I must tell you that in this movement, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that the first place um, for the inaugural launch of these events would obviously be in the West, and in Negril in specific, and, and for that I'm very pleased. But as part of the whole preparation, the Minister of National Security and the Minister of Justice came here with me about six months ago, eh, Mark? About six months ago, and we went up to Orange Hill and had a community meeting with members of the community to have a discussion about how we are going to, to look at this. And, and what we really want to see is how are we going to get these benefits, whether these benefits are going to be in, in making the medicinal side of it, or making um, elements for spa treatments or, or different types of tours. Already I hear that there, there are tours that take place um, in Jamaica where people go and look at different fields. Well, as we are doing that development going forward, how are we going to put those things in place? So for me, it's very important because we have got to set the framework, and that framework is going to have to be buttressed by serious discussion and that framework is going to have legislation because many of the small farmers and small players don't have access to big lawyers or the information or the, the tax component or even some of the technology. So there's a strong role that we're going to have to play to put these things in place. And I think this is going to be an important start. So just to say to all of you, um, welcome to Negril. I, I wish it and hope that you have a truly, truly informative and productive discussion here. And, and with that, it would be my pleasure to welcome the Minister of Justice, um, Mark Golden, to the podium to make his presentation. Thank you. Um, I have been asked to speak about the amendments to the Dangerous Drugs Act um, and the effect of cannabis reforms on Jamaica and its people. 
Um, so I'll just take you, give you a sort of overview of the reforms that we, that we have. I mean, the backdrop to it is that, you know, Jamaica was a country that um, our law relating to, to, to ganja, to cannabis, marijuana, um, was one of absolute prohibition. It was um, treated uh, in the Dangerous Drugs Act as a, um, as a prohibited substance uh, in the same um, manner as cocaine and, and heroin and so on. Um, it was v various offenses around it, from possession, smoking, export, cultivation, and so on, punishable by terms of imprisonment or, or fines, or both. The, the difference, of course, is that Jamaica has a, a, a unique relationship to, the, to cannabis because it is a plant that is extensively used in this country by our citizens. We have, first of all, we have um, the Rastafari community um, that ha regard um, this plant as a, as a sacrament. Um, it has a special place in their faith. Um, and they are, it, that is a, a faith um, that came out of this country and is now an international movement. And the Rastafari people have suffered tremendously over many, many years um, in this country by um, actions taken against them, and many of those actions related to, to, to herb, to ganja. So that was a, a, a burning issue that required um, reform. And with the, especially since the advent of the Charter of Rights, which eliminated, the, there was a provision in the Jamaican Constitution at Independence that grandfathered the legality of all colonial laws. Um, and with the Charter of Rights, one of the things that that did was that, that it eliminated that, that savings provision. So um, we felt that it was clearly unconstitutional for um, the law to prohibit the use of a sacrament by the Rastafarian people. So, because um, our constitution in the Charter of Rights guarantees freedom of religious expression. So that was one element of the reform. But the truth is that ganja is not only used by the Rastafarian community. Ganja is used in a widespread way across Jamaica. Um, and the criminalization of it had led to um, a number of dysfunctional outcomes. One was the, it was a source of, of antagonism, distrust, um, and uh, um, general a problematic relationship between the police and uh, young, uh, young, youngsters, youth, especially in communities which are already under pressure because of a, a lack of resources. Um, it was also, um, as has been said by Minister McNeil, um, the criminal records that were associated with convictions for relatively minor ganja offenses um, interfered in a negative way with the life uh, prospects of persons who um, w w were afflicted with that because, for example, many countries that require visas for Jamaicans to visit would not issue visas to persons who had that on their record. The government, as an employer, doesn't employ persons with, criminal record, with a criminal record and so on. So that was another burning issue. So, um, so that's the context. This thing had been studied in Jamaica from the 1970s. There was a, um, a, a review of it by Parliament, which had recommended decriminalization from then, um, but nothing happened. Um, and there was subsequently a commission appointed, um, headed by Dr. Professor, the late Professor Barry Chavans. Um, and they also, in their report, recommended decriminalization and a special um, acknowledgement of the Rastafarian um, movement and, and, and members of that faith. And that, that their report was studied by a Joint Select Committee of Parliament again in the, in the last decade, but nothing was really done. The international scene changed. Um, and Jamaica, you know, had to, for years some, been somewhat under the cash of the United States um, war on drugs and the um, the efforts of the DEA to eliminate sources of supply in the region. And so that had led to, you know, 
use of chemicals, paraquat and such things, bur uh, you know, chopping down fields, burning fields, and, and so on. With the Obama administration um, and the recognition that of state rights or the uh, affording of tolerance towards the states by the federal government on this issue, we saw a movement in, in the US, significant movement, of course. Everybody in here is aware of it. Colorado basically are moving to a, a criminal, uh, a, a um, uh, effectively legalizing it, ganja in Colorado on, with, in a regulated way. And other states, Washington, Washington State and other states have followed suit and then many, many states that have um, allowed medical marijuana in America. The federal government has not, but the, what the federal government did do was allow the states to operate with some autonomy as long as they kept within certain principles of action so that they, was, they didn't allow the crossing of state lines, um, children aren't allowed to be um, sold marijuana and so on, but within those, the confines of those, those, that, that framework, the states have been allowed more or less to do what the states decide to do. That was a huge change uh, for, for us because it presented a window of opportunity to do some of the things that we'd wanted to do for many years and um, had not really felt that we could because of the adverse international impact or reaction that we would have suffered. So the regulatory system that we, well, the, the change of law that we introduced this year came into effect in April, has essentially decriminalized small quantities which are defined as um, two ounces or less of cannabis um, so that if possession um, or smoking in public um, is no longer an arrestable offense for small quantities. It does not attract prosecution or a right of detention or a criminal record. Uh, it is a ticketable infraction, um, and the ticket, the ticket is a fairly modest sum, and 500 Jamaican dollars, and uh, as I said, does not attract a criminal record. We also amended our criminal records legislation to provide for the automatic expungement of persons who in the past have been convicted of offenses related to ganja involving small quantities. Um, and in order to take advantage of that, an individual simply has to apply for a police certificate or a, an official certificate of their police record. And if they have that on their record, it's treated as an expungement application and, they rec and the record is removed um, from their record and they get a clean certificate. And several, I'm told, you know, I'm not, I don't have a current number, but the last time I checked, uh, the, well over a thousand people had already taken advantage of that. So I think that's a very significant reform for the reasons that have already been discussed. The Rastafarian community, um, first of all, the, the law against possession, well I should say in the, 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 there's no prohibition on smoking in private places um, any longer. That's not a separate offense, but smoking in public is, is not permitted, whether it be tobacco or, or ganja. Um, the Rastafarian community, for the first time, that their religion was acknowledged in a public statute um, in Jamaica, um, and they, uh, their right to possess um, ganja is, is acknowledged in, this, in the law, and there are provisions for their, the designation of religious spaces um, as areas where the prohibition on, um, or the, the restrictions on ganja use do not apply. Um, there are provision for designation of lands for, for, their, for cultivation, for sacramental purposes, and exempt events, which are events primarily for the purpose of observing or celebrating the Rastafarian faith. And the first such event, as has been said, is actually underway as we speak in here in Negril, um, called Rastafari Roots Fest, and they're partnering with High Times Magazine to have a, a cannabis cup, which is a essentially a ranking of the quality of, of locally grown ganja. So, um, and I, I have established an advisory committee um, to guide the Minister of Justice on the um, discretionary um, arrangements that uh, the law provides for in terms of exempt events, um, designation of, of places of worship for Rastafari and the lands for, for sacramental cultivation. The third, um, there's also the right, for example, to persons who are afflicted with chronic illnesses, that um, cancer and other sudden chronic illnesses are given the right to import, if they need, 
um, ganja-based products that are not available here, as long as they are, that's approved by a local physician, um, uh, and the regulations for, around that are being developed as well. And we do have a right of every Jamaican household can cultivate up to five plants um, on, their, on the premises that they occupy. Um, and so that's, that's where we have gone. Now in terms of the medicinal and therapeutic and hemp industries, the, the law provides for the establishment of a cannabis licensing authority. Uh, and it's an interesting authority because it is composed of representatives of the ministries of government that would have a strong interest in this, which would be things like, well, justice is there, and in fact, my representative, Dr. Boxill, is, is present. Um, uh, national security is represented. Um, foreign affairs is represented. Ministry of Finance is represented. Ministry of Investment, Industry, and Commerce are represented. In fact, they have two representatives, one really from the promotional side of it, which is JAMPRO, and, and it, the chairman also of the, of the authority is appointed by the Minister of Investment, Industry, and Commerce. Um, and health, of, of course, is, is represented as well. And I may not have remembered all of the, the ministries. But there are also four slots for um, NGOs or faith-based organizations. And one of the representatives from that category is here, Prophet Greg. He's, so you can hold up your hand, Prophet Greg, so people can see you. Yes, he's on the Cannabis Licensing Authority. And the National Council on Drug Abuse is also represented on the, on the and we have two representatives from the National Council on Drug Abuse here. Um, Mr. Tucker, uh, Michael Tucker, who's executive director, and Dr. Winston Delahaye as well, who's uh, uh, um, one of the, the, uh, the board members. So both, and you raise your hand so everyone can see. Yes, yes, thank you. So where we are with this is that the, the, can, the Cannabis Licensing Authority um, was set up, I would say, probably May or June of this year, um, and the, we initiated a consultancy to assist them with the technical work of developing a regulatory system for Jamaica. And um, consultants were engaged. The, um, it was put out to tender. The, uh, the willing tenderer was engaged to, to, to do that work. And they spent about two months um, doing it. And they sent two people here who met stakeholders and, and surveyed the seen, as it were, in Jamaica, and, and have produced a report, which is, I think, the basis upon which the Cannabis Licensing Authority is moving from that now to develop the actual regulations themselves. And those regulations then will be submitted to the Minister of Justice for approval. Um, and I'm not sure of the time frame. I had said that I was targeting December for that. I don't know if they're going to be able to achieve that or not. But um, everybody is very anxious to see that work complete, of course. And so, um, and Dr. Kathy Ann Brown, who's speaking, is on the Cannabis Licensing Authority as well. She's a representative from the Attorney General's Chambers, I should have met that, and the head of international law in the Attorney General's Chambers, and a, a great asset to us. Um, so the challenge is for Jamaica, I think, in, in developing an, a cannabis, um, a, a regulated cannabis industry, is the two, well, how to reconcile two objectives which are not necessarily fully aligned. And the first objective is the one that Minister McNeil spoke of, which is the policy of the government to ensure that the industry, the regulated lawful industry that would emerge, is to be an inclusive industry, an industry that um, allows small farmers rural communities, persons who have been growing ganja um, for years um, and have s suffered the brunt of that because it's been an illegal activity and there have been you know, significant efforts by the state to, to eliminate that, that those persons, if they want to participate, can do so. That's fundamental as an objective. On the other hand, um, Jamaica is a state governed by the rule of law and has a reputation internationally as a respecter of the rule of law. And we are a party to the um, three conventions that make up the international um, drug treaty system, the UN convention, what's called the single convention of 1961, 
and it's the, amended, the protocol that amended it, and two other subsequent conventions. Which, and the, regu the, the law requires the Cannabis Licensing Authority in designing the regulatory system to do so in a way that is compliant with Jamaica's international obligations. So those two competing objectives need to be reconciled. Um, my own view on this is that the world is in a period of transition, and certainly in this region, we are seeing with greater and greater frequency more and more countries moving towards a more tolerant approach towards cannabis. Um, even in the last week, we have Mexico's Supreme Court, uh, or whatever that their final court is, is called, um, ruling that the personal use of ganja, essentially, um, is, a, is a constitutional right in Mexico. Um, so, and, I, and then today I see in the news that Colombia has announced Colombia, you know, which was very much on the forefront of the war against drugs, um, has announced that they will be um, implementing a, a medical marijuana policy. Um, we have a, a, president, a prime minister just elected two weeks ago, or less, I don't remember the date, in Canada, um, Justin Trudeau, who has expressed a commitment towards the legalization of, of, of cannabis in, in Canada. So these are momentous shifts in the region. And I do think that in the design of the framework for Jamaica, we need to um, push the envelope somewhat in order to ensure that the principal objective of inclusion is not um, sacrificed on the altar of a rigid and strict interpretation of the treaties. The United States itself has propounded that the treaties allow flexibility. And I think Jamaica accepts the approach of flexibility in interpreting those treaties. And so I will be expecting that the regulations will be designed in a way that does enable small farmers who want to come on board to do so. Now, will it be a free-for-all? No, it won't. It cannot be. Will there be reporting and monitoring? Yes, there has to be. But the methodologies and the details of what are the requirements are are where I would like to see um, some creativity and some sensitivity to the needs and capabilities of our small farming community to be expressed. Um, these are persons who live in rural communities, often deep rural communities, Many would have had limited education opportunities, many have very, very limited capital, um, and not necessarily access to, 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 to technology. So we need to design this thing with them in mind. So ladies and gentlemen, I think I will, um, only thing I would say is that, I just, just finished to say that the law does contemplate that the licensing regime will generate revenue, and the revenue um, the law requires a portion of that revenue to be applied for certain things. One is to strengthen the capacities of the National Council on Drug Abuse, um, which they bear the brunt of dealing with the negative aspects of cannabis use um, uh, in the country. Also strengthening mental health services, um, and that is an area which is under-resourced, like many other things in Jamaica, in terms of social services, because we are uh, you know, we have our challenges with the public finances, but this, um, they are to be beneficiaries. Also, public education around responsible um, approaches to the use of, of cannabis uh, to discourage vulnerable um, segments of the population, to discourage vulnerable segments from, from using ganja, um, and so on. So the law is, has tried to be holistic. Similarly, the police are mandated if they come across users who are under 18 or who are exhibiting signs of dependency um, to refer those persons to the National Council for the purpose of um, being assessed and, if necessary, undergoing a rehab program. And we're also, as a separate exercise, looking at a reform of our drug courts to provide for juveniles or for kids between the ages, I think, of 12 and, and, and and adulthood who are currently not part of that system. So we are trying to approach this in a creative and responsible way. I think our work in, the, in this area has been acknowledged in, around the world as being of significance. 
And um, I just hope that we can get the balance that's inherent in, in this exercise right. I'm sure that errors will be made. But on the whole, I think it presents a tremendous opportunity for Jamaica, which I think will be the subject of a lot of what is going to be discussed at this seminar over the next two days. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for being here and for listening. I have no less a person who has been doing work, work not only in Britain, but work internationally, because she is, in fact, the founder or of the Beckley Foundation from 1998. The Beckley Foundation is a UK-based think tank and research center that since its inception, by its establishment by uh, Amanda Fielding, uh, who is incidentally the, I would say, the engine of this particular foundation, Countess of Wemus, she, in fact, has been in the forefront of global drug policy through this particular foundation and scientific research into the potential medical benefits and mechanisms of action of psychoactive substances. Its policy program was among the first to develop drug policy built on a scientific evidence using what we call a scientific evidence-based approach. The program brings together leading international scientists, politicians, and other experts to discuss taboo issues around the complex subject and to explore new regulatory models which, in fact, aim to protect health and reduce the disastrous collateral harms caused by the policies of prohibition. And so, having set up this foundation in 1998, from 2000 onwards, she convened and hosted a series of seminars held at the House of Lords in London. These were the first to bring together scientists, politicians, and thought leaders to share knowledge, foster collaboration, and debate ways forward in reforming global drug policy. And she has, in fact, brought together some of us who have been working in these areas for many years. And she has brought together the team that, in fact, is the core team that is leading the process of trying to develop a national cannabis industry. It is, therefore, not surprising that she would be accompanied by her husband, the Earl of Wemis. Jamie, please stand and take a bow. He has been her faithful companion and, in fact, giving her the support as she goes around the world to influence this particular process, not only in different countries, but also at the level of the United Nations. We in Jamaica are proud to have her with us, notwithstanding the fact that she lives in Jamaica, somewhere, I think, perched on a hill in Portland. But she is with us, and we could have no better person to begin to respond to that legal framework or legislative framework expressed by Senator Goley. It is with, my, with pleasure that I invite Amanda Fielding, Fielding Countess of Wims, Director, Beckley Foundation UK, her topic the failure of the war on drugs and Jamaica's pioneering journey towards regulation. Please give her a big round of applause. Well, thank you, Professor Davidson, for your kind words. And um, I'm amazed to hear a minister 
talk such wise words. I've heard many ministers in many years talk a lot of rubbish, and it's very, very nice <laughs> to hear someone talk such good sense. Um, and thank you for inviting me in the Beckley to help support you and the government in the development of the policies. It is wonderful that Jamaica has now not only decriminalized cannabis, eliminating previous convictions for possession, but has also fully acknowledged the religious rights of the Rastafarians, thus becoming the first state to properly recognize the religious use of cannabis. I'm delighted to be working with the government and other experts in organizing this conference where leaders in the field can discuss how best to introduce a fully regulated industry for medical cannabis. The outcomes of these and other discussions will feed into the process for the two, 2016 U United Nations General Assembly Special Session on Global Drug Policy. It is an honor to be working at the forefront of this vitally important area. Jamaica is such a beautiful jewel in an island much loved and respected throughout the world with a global recognition far above its small size. It is the one place in the world where cannabis use has a positive reputation due to its association with the Rastafarians and the reggae music. On the global scene, I think we've finally reached a tipping point. The intellectual battle against the war on drugs has, for the most part, been won. Most intelligent people relevant that it is impossible to eradicate a market through prohibition. Where there is a demand, there will always be a way to fit it. Criminalization of cannabis has caused uncontrolled suffering around the world, while its prevalence has increased dramatically since it was banned. However, that is merely the intellectual part. That on the ground has only just begun, and that is where Jamaica is now leading the desire to alter consciousness is part of human nature. Altering conscious states has, from the very beginning, been deeply interwoven with the evolution of the human society, including the creation of music, language, art, medicine, spirituality, and community bonding. By banning many of the favorite techniques of altering consciousness, the United Nations and the governments of the world are trespassing deeply into personal liberty and human rights. If a person is not in any way damaging anyone else by their interaction, it should be their freedom to choose their preferred state of consciousness. This basic right to the freedom, the free development of personality, was recently recognized by the Supreme Court in Mexico. There is no doubt that the war on drugs approach to the control of psychoactive substances has been a disaster with catastrophic consequences at every level. I cannot think of another civil decision that has caused so much global suffering. Prohibition of psychoactive substances has created a vast criminal market run by individuals, often acting with a ruthlessness which shakes the fabric of civilized society. Prohibition leads to the drugs consumed getting ever stronger, opium to heroin, coca to crack cocaine, and traditional cannabis to high THC super skunk. The illegal market has become a cancer in society, causing illness, violence, corruption, and even the destabilization of countries and regions. It is not the drugs themselves that cause these problems, but the effects of the policies controlling them. Prohibition further ob obstructs the access of 80% of the world's population to essential medicines, such as pain medication, access to which is a basic human right. Prohibition also obstructs scientific research into the potential benefits of cannabis and other controlled substances medicines that, if researched and used appropriately, could relieve immense suffering globally. It would have been much better if these substances 
had remained as an integral part of a social fabric, controlled by social pressure, with the purpose of minimizing harm and optimizing benefits. Personally, I think it was a disaster to relegate one of the biggest industries in the world to criminal cartels, rather than the governments of the world and their boards of experts working out scientifically the safest and most effective ways of managing this human desire to alter consciousness. As we all know, the drug laws are not based on scientific knowledge. Alcohol and tobacco, two legal methods of altering consciousness, can be extremely damaging to health and expensive to society. They would never have been permitted under the current health criteria. The legal basis of prohibition, the UN conventions, created by the USA, which surprisingly does not feel bound to obey them itself, was based on scientific was not based on scientific evidence, but rather on political ideology, vested interests, and prejudices. The conventions have stood like sacred scriptures, unaltered by the advances of science over the last 55 years. Not a word has been changed. It is now time to update these conventions so that individual countries can experiment with new approaches that they think would better serve the health and well-being of their citizens. The Jamaican government must be applauded for its brave decision to go beyond mere decriminalization of cannabis possession and to legalize home cultivation for medicinal, spiritual, and sacramental use, thereby recognizing the re religious rights of the Rastafari community, and further to create a new licensed industry for medicinal cannabis and hemp. It is to be hoped that this new framework will ensure that the potential benefits to the citizens of the nation are maximized. There are many advantages to a legal regulated market. Criminalizing users can ruin lives, fill prisons, and cause immense suffering to individuals and their families. A strictly regulated market is better able to protect the youth by not selling to minors, by labeling the products, by prohibiting advertising, and by providing credible information and treatment where necessary. Furthermore, the savings on enforcement and money raised by taxation can fund improved education, treatment, and research. By recognizing the potential medicinal value of cannabis, Jamaica opens the doors to scientific research and the freedom of doctors to prescribe cannabis for the treatment of many illnesses. It will also open the door to, to Jamaica becoming an an island of well-being for foreign visitors, providing clinics with cannabis-assisted therapy for the treatment of many problematic conditions, such as depression, addiction, post-traumatic stress disorder, and pain. With careful management, this could become a valuable source of income and foreign exchange. With the Jamaican government commitment to medical research and the expertise of the scientific community in Jamaica. Research into cannabis can now flourish. The Beckley Foundation greatly looks forward to collaborating in this exciting movement, which has the potential to open up new avenues of treatment and thereby end much suffering worldwide. I set up at the Beckley Foundation in 1998 with the dual purpose of reforming global drug policy and opening up scientific research into the medical potential and therapeutic benefits of cannabis and other psychoactive substances. For the last 17 years, I have promoted policies based on health, harm reduction, cost effectiveness, and respect of human rights, and have simultaneously opened up scientific research into the potential medicinal and therapeutic benefits of cannabis and other traditional plants. It is therefore a delight for me to be accompanying the Jamaican people 
on this exciting new journey. If Jamaica could crystallize this potential, it would not only benefit its citizens and the economy, but also enhance the position of Jamaica in the world. It would be wonderful if Jamaica's reputation at the forefront of athletics and music could be mirrored by a reputation for leadership in the field for regulation and medical use of cannabis. Over the years, I and the Beckley Foundation have worked in collaboration with leading academic institutions around the world, undertaking scientific research and clinical studies into the benefits of cannabis. We are now looking forward to working with Jamaican universities and the Rastafarian communities to cultivate and undertake scientific research on different strains of cannabis. We will particularly focus on strains that have a therapeutic balance, THC, CBD, and other cannabinoids and terpenes, in order to optimize the pain-relieving qualities and other medicinal applications, such as the treatment of cancer and overcoming addiction. The Foundation is currently working with University College London to compare the different effects, the different effects of different strains of cannabis with varying THC CBD ratios using brain imaging technology. I also look forward to focusing on Jamaica's land race strains, which have become almost extinct in today's cannabis market. We will preserve and study these land races in order to protect the genetic diversity and conserve it as part of the Rastafari cultural heritage. The Beckley Foundation is unique in working both the fields of scientific and policy fields, which are in fact interdependent. Since 2011, there's been a seismic shift in favor of drug policy reform. Finally, intelligent and respected people worldwide have realized that prohibition does not work and that we need a more subtle approach to drug policies that takes account of reality and which aims to minimize harms at every level while respecting the freedom of individual choice. In 2006, I realized that although cannabis constituted 80% of illicit drug use, it was almost never mentioned at international organizations such as the UN. So I convened the Beckley Foundation's Global Cannabis Commission. Its subsequent report, Cannabis Policy, Moving Beyond Stalemate, written by the leading academics in the field, recommended decriminalization and regulation, and has been highly influential in the USA and around the world. In 2010, I commissioned a report, Roadmap for Reforming the UN Drug Convention, in order to provide a framework for countries or groups of countries to develop alternative drug policies, explaining how countries might amend their international obligations in order to allow them more freedom to formulate national policies that better suit their special needs in place of the current one-size-fits-all prohibitionist approach mandated by the UN Drug Convention. 1961, 1971, 1988. This report was pioneering in showing how countries might clearly and explicitly decriminalize the possession and use of controlled substances such as cannabis and move towards a fully regulated and taxed market. As the research into the potential therapeutic potential of this extraordinary plant continues, the global market for cannabis products is likely to grow substantially. We live in exciting times as the edifice of prohibition is beginning to crumble and the realization of the amazing properties of this unique plant continue to grow. I hope that the United Kingdom will learn some lessons from Jamaica's progress and will at least begin by recognizing the rights of those in need of access to cannabis for medicinal and religious purposes. 
I would like again to thank Minister Mark Golding for inviting me to help organise this pivotal event in the setting of the Rasta Fest and also to thank you all who have taken time out of your busy schedule to attend this conference and help me. Thank you most sincerely, Countess Amanda. Ladies and gentlemen, I think, well, it's properly documented because I was held by every sentence, every word, because I could not, in fact, find any basis for contradiction. Thank you very much. Dr. Kathy Ann Brown is also a member of another advisory committee that has to do with setting the regulations known as the committee is referred to as the licensing authority or CLA, Central Licensing Authority. But she is in a different capacity this morning. This morning, she is in fact going to speak to the topic of financial policy challenges affecting the international cannabis industry. What is to be done, I assume, will be the question that will be answered. And there is no other competent person or more competent person than Dr. Cathy Ann Brown who has the credentials of being presently the Deputy Solicitor General and directing international uh, agencies' attorney general's chambers, in the attorney general's chambers. She's the former deputy director of legal and legal advisor of the Commonwealth Secretariat in the UK. She's also the former external consultant for the ACP group of countries, the Secretariat in Brussels and Belgium. She's also the former senior technical advisor, the Caribbean regional negotiating machinery of the UK and UK and Geneva. And she also has made contribution to law in her own country by being a former lecturer at the law school. She has very enviable academic credentials being a PhD in law, masters and bachelors, and of course, a legal education certificate. It is therefore with pleasure that I invite Dr. Cathy Ann Brown, Deputy Solicitor General, Attorney General's Department, to speak to the topic on financial policy challenges affecting the international cannabis industry, answering the question, what? is to be done. To go on with it. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I think it's, it's um, uh, fitting that I should follow the minister who spoke about the progress, the Countess of Wim Wimsis, who spoke about the promise, because I'm to speak about the problem. There are two issues why ganja is important. Ganja is important because of the International Drugs Conventions, and the next slide deals with the international cooperation in financial markets. So you have the single convention, which you've heard about, and the, basically that convention proscribes trading ganja except for medical and scientific purposes. There's an exception for the Constitution, for example, for us the Rastafarian right people, but I'd also say privacy. But for example, the Countess um, mentioned uh, the fact that in Latin American constitutions, they actually have an express provision which deals with the fact that you cannot criminalize or, or prohibit conduct which only affects you and does no one any harm. And that provision in their constitutions has made a huge difference in the courts opening up um, uh, 
the issue of, of marijuana or ganja. There's also an exception which deals with denatured drugs, such as, her, as um, hemp. Uh, but the problem, what is the problem? And this goes to the issue where the Countess was speaking about science. In the 1961 convention, we have a situation where cannabis is a Schedule IV drug. That means a drug which is declared to have absolutely no medical value, none whatsoever. So it, it's like the worst kind of drug you could have. Then you have the 1988 convention which says that it must be a crime. So on the global scheme, you have ganja, cannabis being this terrible drug. Next slide. The last convention really doesn't deal that much with us. Then you have the financial markets. And we know that everything is global. You get your remittances, that's an international transfer. You buy something on Amazon, that's an international transfer. So we have, in 1989, FADEF, that's the Financial National Task Force, which is set up of the OECD countries, came up with this thing about they're going to have a system of recommendations, et cetera, to deal with threats to the integrity of the international financial system. And each sub-region, for example, uh, CFATF, CARICOM, can, can you still read it? Okay. Okay, CFATF, CARICOM, um, uh, is the regional uh, system of it. Now, they have recommendations and standards which are done by peer review, and that classifies each country. So, for example, Jamaica had a CFATF review recently, the Caribbean Financial National Task Force, and they looked at our liberalization of, of the drugs under our legislation, and why? because the way in which a country is ranked affects the way foreign banks treat us. So, f so when we had our CFATF review, they wanted to make sure that we were playing by the rules. And the fact that Jamaica is also a transit and source country for drugs makes it difficult for us. So one, we have the looking at our classification. So the banks look at how is the country ranked? The CFATF review was positive because they said it looks like we're doing things, we're following the international rules. <coughs> then you have the Vienna Convention. Now you have a series of conventions. One of them is the same Vienna Convention which was mentioned before, which then deals with money laundering and all states have to take jurisdiction over money laundering in a vast area. And you have also the Paler Palermo Convention and other conventions which are the same things. Flip to the next slide. So what I'm saying is, on the one hand, you have conventions dealing with international cooperation to fight money laundering and anything dealing with, with uh, financial crimes, and cannabis, ganja, being treated as something which once you deal with, if it's not for medical or scientific purposes, it's basically something which is bad money. So, how do you apply a regime in conflicting rules? Because bad money mixes with good. So we just spoke about the fact that the difference in the constitutional regimes means that different countries have been able to legitimately legalize ganja for different purposes, like here for us with respect to the Rastafarians, because of their constitutional provisions. And also the fact that there is no total consensus on change. You have countries like Russia, which are still, if you look at their submissions into the UNGAS process, it is radical. When I say radical, I mean to the other extreme. They don't want a button changed. Um, uh, and then all of this blurs the, the fact that some countries are nevertheless pushing ahead with liberalization while the international regime re remains strict means that there's a blurring between licit and illicit. And that is ex exacerbated, if you turn the next slide, in the US market. Because in the US, it's not an issue of a country having a single regime. It's an issue of a country, a federal and a state regime being different. So you have the General Control Substances Act in the US, which makes it illegal. But then you have the states legalizing it within their their domestic realm. And it's not just medical and scientific, which is done at the uh, international stage, which would be OK, but it's also recreational, like Colorado. And so you have Cole Menno, fin fin um, FinCEN guidance. FinCEN is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. 
and then you have core supplemental guidance. Next, next slide. Now, um, the reason why I'm telling you these things is because this has, it's US, but it affects the world. It's like from the US to the world. Um, the core memo priorities. Now, these priorities are some things you're going to see, the, even the banks look out for. Now, what the core memo has said is that they will not use their enforcement resources to go after you if you are pursuing marijuana industry, the cannabis industry, if you follow these guidelines. And there are things like not distributing to minors, not growing cannabis on, on, on state lands, um, not uh, trafficking, um, you know, transiting, you, you, trading between states, like going from one state that allows marijuana to one state that does not allow marijuana. But the thing about it is, what does the core memo say at the end? They're saying that even if you follow the priorities, we're not telling you that there's absolutely no way you're going to be prosecuted. So flip to the next side. Because the next side deals with the banks. Because the first thing that FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, has said to the banks is, you have to do due diligence. Remember that International Corporation on Money Laundering, Anti-Money Laundering, and Counter-Terrorist Financing means everyone has to cooperate. So every time you go to a bank, every bank you go to is doing AML, Anti-Money Laundering, and Counter-Terrorist Financing due diligence. And what FinCEN has said to all the banks is you have to look at the core memo priorities and in looking at every client that you have which has a marijuana related business, you have to vet the client. And why did FinCEN give this guidance? And it's interesting, FinCEN gave this guidance to help the situation. Because in the United States, and we have to remember that before the United States had this dichotomy at the federal and state level, you had some countries like Israel that were greatly going ahead with their medical marijuana. Um, but when United States had this dichotomy with state liberalizing for recreational marijuana, the money began to flow. And the banks wouldn't take the money because there's criminal prosecution if you deal with tainted money. So FinCEN gave this guidance to help. And I say to help because if you look at the guidance, you wonder if it helps. Because a bank has to, every time an industry, a business comes that is related to marijuana, they have to report on that business. And they have red flags, and they also have a threshold. Next slide. So the threshold says every single entity that has anything to do with marijuana, you have to either classify them as marijuana limited, marijuana priority, or marijuana termination. Marijuana limited means I've looked at this entity, they look like they're doing everything by the rules, but I have to notify them because state law says they can do it, but federal law says they can't, so that means that they are a suspect entity. Marijuana priority means you know, I can't verify that they're not trading with minors or that it's not affecting drug, um, what they call d drug driving, which is one of the core priorities. I can't verify all these things, so I have to consider the priority. Mar mar marijuana termination means, you know what, I can't handle this business. Not that this business is necessarily doing anything wrong. I can't handle it, so I'm closing the account. Next slide. There are red flags you look for. The red flags are things like, if I'm a marijuana company and I say that I'm Brown Incorporated, am I trying to disguise that I'm a marijuana business? If I'm a marijuana business and I do interstate, or God, sorry, heaven forbid, uh, international transactions, those are all red flags. Next slide. So what does every bank with any marijuana business have to do for due diligence? One. It has to verify that the state authorizes it and that the license is registered. They have to review the license application and all related documentations. They have to request from the state licensing and enforcement authorities information. They have to develop an understanding of that business's activities. 
what is legitimate and is what is not legitimate, and the customers, they have to monitor continually all sources of information about the business. They have to monitor all suspicious activity, and they have to refresh customer information. Now, when you have me as a client, and I don't, it, I'm not involved in marijuana, I'm fine. When you pick me up as a client and I have a marijuana business,